This is Splice. Hey, people of Splice Pink. Welcome back. I'm Rishad. I'm one of the co-founders of Splice. As you know, we've been doing a mini-series on reader revenue these past few episodes. We're talking to Jane Marnie at Private Media in Melbourne. She's setting up a reader revenue team. In her last episode, she told us all about onboarding. This one is all about marketing. But first, Jane, what's going on with the lockdown? Hey, everyone. Hope everyone is well this week. Where I am in Melbourne, Australia, we've just gone into a lockdown. We hadn't had any cases of coronavirus for about three months, and we've just had a small outbreak. So we're all back at home, um, not able to go out for more than a couple of hours a day, all stuck within a five-kilometre radius of our house. But fingers crossed it should be a quick lockdown. Today, I wanted to talk about marketing and how we think of marketing in the reader revenue team. But before I do that, given the kind of backdrop of a sudden snap lockdown, I thought it was actually a good time to quickly talk about some of the issues that can come up with setting up a new team here at Private Media. Yeah, so, you know, obviously over the last few weeks, everything's been really exciting. We've had all these changes, setting up a new team. Obviously, there are so, there is some stress that comes along with that and a few bottlenecks here and there that kind of, you know, create issues. So we're kind of in in a little bit of a sticky spot at the moment where, um, you know, we had our first new hire start last week. We've got one next week and then one the week after. Um, but we are still trying to hire for one last person in the team. Uh, unfortunately, that person is the one who will backfill a lot of my role at Crikey. So, um what that means is I'm trying to set up the new team, move into this new position as head of reader revenue. Um, for those who don't know, prior to that, I was Crikey's associate publisher. And this is why I wanted to talk about marketing today. Uh, we are about to come into our biggest campaign of the year for Crikey. So I'm also trying to get that set up and roll that out. Um, hopefully break a few cash records. Last year was amazing. We kind of pulled out all the stops and made a ton of money in one month, which was a record for the business. But yeah, looking to top that again this year with everything else that's going on. So obviously, you know, setting up a new team is always going to have its teething issues. I think this is the first big one. It's going to be a big month. Um, I'm kind of weirdly looking forward to the intensity of it, but also looking forward to it being done and having the full team in place. Um, so yeah, that's, that's some of the less fun parts of setting up the new team that I wanted to put out there. Um, very keen to hear other people's experiences around teething issues and that kind of thing, you know, balancing new roles with old roles and that kind of transition. But in the meantime, let's talk about marketing. So like I said, essentially the reader revenue team is a marketing team, um, we have our three brand managers who own and execute the marketing strategies for each of their publications. We have a performance marketer in that team who looks after all our paid social and search ads and that sort of thing. And then we do have our digital marketing exec as well who who is a support role to the rest of the team. So like I said, the, the main function is marketing around subscription marketing in particular. So I wanted to talk about the kind of four different components that we think of in terms of our marketing types and then cover off a few golden rules um, that I think are essential to people who are trying to market subscription news products specifically because it is it is a unique product, which is what makes it so exciting to work on. Um, so yeah, our four main kind of gears that we can shift into when we're marketing, we have our always on offers, um, our always on intro offer. I think most publications will have some variation of this Ours is your first 12 weeks for $12. I think that's pretty standard across the industry, but, you know, you'll see people do first month free um, or, you know, at, at some sort of discounted onboarding period after that, people roll on to full price. Um, our users at the end of their 12 weeks, they actually roll on to not quite full price. Um, we give them a 30% discount which lasts for their first year. So that's that's a means of retaining them after that intro period. Um, we specifically 
chose 12 weeks um, because it gives people time to, to become habituated around the product. You know, that's so crucial, getting people to a point, particularly with a subscription product, where the idea of not having it is very troublesome to them and they, they're happy to pay full price or that kind of next step up. As I'll always say, I think testing is the most important thing and working out what works for your publication. So as part of that kind of always on intro offer that dovetails into our automated email marketing that we have on at all times, um, email's our main channel. We're investing in people, obviously our performance marketer and um, tech around sort of expanding that and getting much better at our offsite ads and marketing. Um, so, you know, things through like Facebook ads and Google search um, and coming up with better ways to integrate that with our email marketing and on-site messaging as well. But for now, and I think for a long time, emails will be our most effective channel. So um, yeah, our automated marketing has around 40 emails in that series. I would like to see the brand manager come in and totally overhaul it, um, maybe add some stuff. It's It's pretty targeted. So this, these are the kind of emails that if you're on a free trial, for example, your welcome email, your sort of midpoint email, your sales email, your kind of email if you don't convert a few weeks later, um, that that journey that users go on. But there's there's multiple across the business. You know, it depends what product people are on. Are they coming up for renewal? Did they renew? Did they churn? What product did they churn from? Yeah, so it's a pretty sprawling web of messaging. We also have these big once a quarter campaigns um, and we always offer, we, we put a different offer into market than we would with our always on. And that's so that we can manufacture this kind of sense of scarcity and urgency around that offer. More often than not, it's a half price annual subscription. I'm a big fan of getting people onto annual subscriptions. I think around 80, 90% of our users are on an annual membership and if you compare the churn rates, even with your really well-performing monthly or quarterly or six-month products, compared to an annual, the churn is just so much lower on an annual. There's so many less sort of opportunities to churn. The revenue is a lot more predictable across the course of the year. So um, yeah, that's my favorite one to put out there. So yeah, we put in we put out a big quarterly campaign that usually runs for a couple of weeks. That's the one that we've got coming up in June. Um, but then our kind of third stream, marketing stream is our ad hoc campaigns. And these ones tend to be the ones that are the most fun. Um, so this, these are the kind of, you know, flash sales that we'll put out there depending on what's going on in the news cycle. So a good example is one that we did earlier this year. Um, for those of you who follow what's going on in Australia and social media and that kind of thing might remember that earlier this year, Facebook banned news in Australian news feeds uh, and that was in response to laws that were being looked at uh, in Australia around making platforms like Facebook and Google pay for news. Um, so they briefly banned all news publications in Australian news feeds. Uh, we all woke up to find our news feeds totally kind of warped. It was a weird time. Um, but yeah, so the morning that was announced that afternoon, we had an email marketing campaign. Uh, we ran it pretty much until the end of that ban. So it was about five days and the signups on that were, were fantastic. So that actually ended up being great for us. Not something we would want long-term, but yeah, we were able to swoop in and make the most of it. So we have these kind of ad hoc campaigns that we will run as a response to whatever's going on in the news cycle. We usually drop everything and try to get them out as soon as possible. So like I said, they're, they're a lot of fun. And then finally, um, marketing around editorial products. So we've just run a campaign um, around a big series that our editorial team have been working on for over a year. They published a dossier of lies and falsehoods of our prime minister the marketing that we took around that, we decided that it was an awareness exercise. So 
It was a series that we weren't going to use to try to convert people to pay for Crikey. We wanted to get it in front of as many people as possible. We thought the journalism was incredibly important and so rightfully so it should be out, out in front of as many people as possible. But our marketing team obviously work with the editorial team to, f- to strategize around the best ways to make the most of the work that they do. So those are our four main marketing types that we look at. So that was our always on and automated offers, big two week long quarterly campaigns, our ad hoc campaigns we run in relation to what's going on in the news cycle and our editorial campaigns. It's a constant kind of balancing act between all four. No one of those is more important than the others. Yeah, always an interesting and fun challenge. So the the other thing I wanted to think about uh, my kind of three golden rules for marketers working on a news product. Um, The first one and the one that I think is probably the most important for people working in the news industry. I don't think this really applies outside of the news industry. The first one is the line is not where you think it is. So as marketers working on news products, I think we're so frightened a lot of the time, or I hear this from other publications as well, we're so frightened about annoying our readers. We have this idea that marketing is a little bit icky, uh, we don't want to bother them, we, you know... You'll see some publications asking for donations and they're almost kind of like, oh, you know what, it's, if, if you'd like to give us some money, actually, you know what, don't even worry about it, it's fine. Um, but I, I think you've got to push it. You've got to market aggressively. This is why I want to hire people who come from like e-commerce backgrounds and that kind of thing um, because they have that aggression. I'd rather be trying to reel them in a bit. But this is something we learned in particular last year during the pandemic or particularly during the start of the pandemic. We were marketing pretty heavily. We didn't know, you know, what was going to happen month to month in the state of the world. So we were just putting out campaigns constantly. Um, We started using our on-site assets. So ad spots, call to actions around the website, things that we hadn't juiced as much as we had before. We also started taking over our newsletter products in a way that we hadn't before, um, sending out more and more marketing emails, getting more aggressive with our paid advertising. I think for most newsrooms, there's so much further that they can go with their marketing before they're going to get to a point of annoying people that much. And to be honest, every marketing campaign will bring some unsubscribes from your email list. I think not running a marketing campaign because you're worried about losing a bunch of people that you probably were never going to convert anyway. um, That's, yeah, that for me, that doesn't really stack up as a reason to not keep running campaigns. So that's number one. Number two, you need to get the journalists and the editorial team involved with your campaigns. I've I've spoken to newsrooms where they almost act in that kind of old model where, you know, once upon a time when newsrooms relied mostly on ad revenue and the ad team sat quite separately to the editorial team and they just sort of, you know, were ships in the night in terms of their work. You get some marketing departments trying to sell a reader revenue product in that way and it just doesn't work. You know, people aren't subscribing because of a clever marketing campaign, although, you know, obviously that helps. But at the end of the day, they're subscribing because they want good journalism and they want access to those journalists. They want to hear from the journalists themselves. They probably want a discount as well. That that certainly helps. Um, often, disappointingly, discount goes a lot further than a clever marketing campaign. Um, but yeah, getting, getting the journalists involved. So we've run several campaigns over the last year and a half where we've featured the journos front and center. This time last year, our entire campaign over the course of a couple of weeks came from one of the journalists individually. We had their picture on it. We had their name on it. They had a special message. Um, a lot of it was talking about, you know, what it was like to cover history from their living rooms, um, essentially. That was an amazing campaign and we've kind of doubled down on that. So nothing comes from the marketing team. Everything comes from or signed off by an editor or a journalist, particularly if we have a couple of newsletters that come from individual journos. So adding a marketing message in the introduction to their newsletter is always super effective or doing a marketing email to their readers is super effective as well. So 
Yeah. At the end of the day, if you're selling a subscription product, people are buying the news product itself. They're buying access to the journalists. So they want to hear from the journalists. They don't want to hear from a marketing team. So yeah, newsrooms who, who are kind of siloed need to find a way to bridge those gaps and get the journalists involved and help them understand that they're the point of it all. So getting them on board is, is crucial. Third and final golden rule, I've said this before, I'll say it again, is test everything. I mean, we we test what we can. I would love to see more detailed testing schedule, particularly in our marketing campaigns. Testing does involve a lot of resources, but you know, you can always A-B test a subject line or the copy in an email at least. You can do so much testing if you're doing any paid advertising on Facebook or that kind of thing. There's always scope for testing no matter what. I've been running tests around dynamic pricing, so offering people who are coming up for renewal who aren't particularly engaged, trying out different price points with them during a big campaign to get a sense of whether that's a road that we want to go down. I mean, obviously it is. It's it's just a means of working out how it looks in our business. So even if you can't test creative or that sort of thing, you can always split up email send lists and come up with different tests around price points, messaging, that sort of thing. I mean, there's there's a lot you can do regardless of the resources that you have. It's just about getting creative and making sure that you have a clear hypothesis before you launch that test and you're not just testing for the sake of running a test and have no intention of ever doing anything with what you find out from that information. Anyway, bit of a long one today, but yeah, that is how we think of marketing. Like I said, things are a little busy and there's, we're sort of in that messy middle point of setting up a new team, but yeah, looking forward to keeping everyone updated and also filling you in as to how our marketing campaign goes. Thanks. See ya. See ya.